Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Staying Happy and Healthy at Home with JIA. My name is Dr. Sarah Tabor, and I'm a pediatric rheumatologist at the Hospital for Special Surgery, uh, where I specialize in autoimmune diseases in kids, um, including JIA or juvenile idiopathic arthritis. In today's webinar, we're going to be discussing some challenges faced by kids with JIA, particularly during the pandemic, as well as some strategies for coping and keeping your kids safe, happy, and healthy. I have three guests with me today. Uh, Laura Gabowski, who's a pediatric dietitian at HSS. Peyton Katz, a pediatric uh, family and patient coordinator and a child life specialist at HSS. And Jennifer Jessicael, a physical therapist and pediatric clinical specialist at HSS. So thank you so much everybody for participating and uh, thank you to our audience for listening. So I wanna start off by discussing some challenges that our patients and their parents may be facing at this time. Uh, some of which may be unique to kids with JIA and some of which, you know, all kids and all adults are really dealing with right now. So Peyton, maybe you could start us off by discussing some of the difficulties uh, faced by families with kids of different ages during quarantine. Thank you, Dr. Tabor. While children and adults alike are experiencing difficulty and changes during this pandemic, there are a few specific challenges faced by children of different age groups, as well as those experienced by children with chronic illness. All of us are faced with the loss of our typical routines, and for children and teens, this is particularly disorienting. This can result in children feeling like they need to regain control in their lives and might lead to them acting out. Younger children, in particular, might regress in their development when faced with this stress. In terms of age-specific differences, preschool-age children tend to believe that something they did might have caused loved ones to get sick, or that if parents are seen as upset, it might be the child's fault. For preteens and teenagers, peer relationships are integral to teenagers' development and separation from friends and the missing of social milestones are particularly challenging. On top of these responses, children with JIA are faced with additional challenges during quarantine. They are likely wondering what the virus means for them as someone with a chronic disease and could experience significant stress related to this unknown. The lack of in-person visits with their doctors and therapists and any missed support group sessions can lead to feelings of isolation and might delay when they bring up any concerns they're having. Depending where a family lives, some children and teens have also been unable to go outside regularly, which adds to the other stressors and emotional challenges they might be experiencing. Thank you so much, Peyton. Um, so, you know, no matter where families are quarantined, um, a lot of children and adults have very changed in different activity patterns right now. Um, Jennifer, I wonder if you could maybe comment on some of the more physical challenges of being in quarantine? Yeah, sure. I think certainly children and adults alike are facing many different challenges associated with staying active amidst this pandemic. Many of us are sitting much more throughout the day um, in one position, certainly as children are now doing virtual learning for school, and many parents are now working from home. Um, and for some, the physical environment might be less than ideal, be it the position of a chair or the position of a laptop. Um, and to add to this, we all have less opportunities to move throughout the day um, as we all do our best to stay at home. Um, so with the closure of local playgrounds and the inability of some to participate in organized sports, certainly children of all ages are no doubt experiencing less opportunities to be active each day. For children with JIA, staying active right now has never been more important. Um, so changing positions frequently during the day, um, so it can help, and stretching can help to reduce some of the limitations that they might have in joint motion um, or some muscle stiffness that they might be experiencing. Engaging in activities to get up uh, out of the chair and regular movement. So for example, reaching up for something and raising onto your toes or squatting down to reach for things that are on the floor can be just some activities to kind of promote general strengthening of the leg muscles. Um, and certainly if your child was recently diagnosed with JIA or is experiencing symptoms that might be associated with acute inflammation, it might also be beneficial for your child to actually receive formal physical or occupational therapy services uh, that would be in accordance, of course, with, um, with your child's physician. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, another challenge that a lot of our families are facing right now is maintaining appropriate nutrition, uh, whether that's due to economic circumstances or due to difficulty obtaining food or just um, due to different patterns uh, of appetite in children. Laura, I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. 
Sure, absolutely. So the thing to keep in mind is, despite what everything else that's going on, the same rules still apply, and that a healthy diet for both children and adults remains equally important during that time. The key now is that accomplishing that may be a little bit more difficult. So while usually I do encourage families to get their kids involved in the supermarket, obviously now that wouldn't be appropriate. But what you can do is still involve children in the meal planning and preparing grocery lists. So getting, making it more of a family activity as well. And so that's a great way to keep kids engaged in wanting to be a part of their um, actual and what they're eating. And it might make them more willing to try some new foods as well. And again, so we want to make sure that we're still, I, I say, you know, you still want to have those shelf stable pantries which includes your beans, nuts, nut butters, things like that. But also a big important one that I encourage people is to get some herbs and spices because it's a fun way to mix up foods as well. But you can take some fresh produce and mix it with the canned gross canned foods and this way you can kind of pair some of the fresh stuff. And again, you can also get some fresh vegetables and if you know that you're not gonna use them all, you can cut them up, put them in an airtight bag. The key that I remind everyone is to make sure that you're labeling and dating the bags. This way you don't find something in the freezer from several months ago and you don't know when it's from. So that's important. But another thing I always like to highlight, good nutrition is only one part of this, but it's never um, a substitute for taking for your children taking their medication. So that remains important as well. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned medications because one thing that's come up uh, for us a lot that we're getting a lot of phone calls about, um, you know, in light of the pandemic is whether or not it's safe for kids to keep taking their medications. Um, and those uh, tend to be specifically for kids with JIA and said medications or immunosuppressant medications. Um, Early on in the pandemic, there was some concern that NSAIDs uh, may cause um, more severe outcomes with COVID. And that's something that's been looked into. The science really doesn't seem to support that. Um, there's also the concern, obviously, with taking immunosuppressive medicines, whether or not your body you know, would be sort of prepared to fight off an infection if you were to get it. Uh, that's something that's definitely still under review as well, but early, uh, early information is suggesting that there actually isn't a big risk to being on immunosuppressive medicine. The most important thing if you're a parent who's worried about a medication that your kid is taking is that you speak with your doctor and not make any changes uh, before speaking with your physician and coming up with a plan together. So, you know, we're very aware that people are concerned about this um, and it's something we're very happy to discuss, but it's really important not to make uh, changes in your in your child's medication without talking about it first. Okay, so you know now that we've discussed some of the challenges that people have been facing, um, I'd like to talk about some recommendations that we have for keeping your kids happy and healthy. And then we'll wrap up with a few demonstrations to give you some concrete skills uh, that you could go ahead and use. So Peyton, can you maybe talk a little bit about your thoughts about how to keep your kids calm and engaged during this time? Yes, so the first step to keeping kids calm during quarantine is making sure that they feel safe. One way to do this is through the implementation and maintenance of routines in your child's day. Routines help children know what to expect and promote a feeling of safety in uncertain times. Keeping to meal times and bedtimes, as well as setting specific times for schoolwork and other activities are good practices for children of all ages. If children appear to be worrying, you should validate their feelings Allow them to ask questions and remember that it's okay to say you don't know the answer. For kids with JIA, reassure them that their doctor is still an available resource to them during the quarantine and that they should share any questions or concerns with you and their doctor so that you can address them together. Remember that your child looks to you for indications of how he or she should feel during unknown situations. If you are visibly worried, your child will think there's something for them to be concerned about. These are difficult times and it's okay for you for you to let your child see worry, but it is important to reassure them in these moments of all the things that you are doing to help them stay safe. As far as keeping children engaged, we live in a digital world and it's okay for online games and activities to play a part in your child's life at this time, but we wanna make sure there is a balance. While online, encourage your child to interact with friends and loved ones. They can do an activity or play a game together or just spend time talking on the phone or over video. Offline, incorporating activities that promote a feeling of purpose or giving back are incredibly therapeutic and help children to cope in challenging situations. Children can draw pictures or write letters to thank frontline heroes. 
Children with JIA might also want to use this time to think about how they can help other kids facing a chronic illness or coping with a hospital experience. Many school-aged children and teens in particular find purpose and joy in giving back to other children who are experiencing something that they've already been through. That's great. Thank you so much, Peyton. Jennifer, do you have any general tips on staying active before we move into the specific demonstrations? Yeah, sure. So just, you know, there are certainly some simple things that you can consider. I think uh, to kind of dovetail what Peyton had mentioned uh, in terms of keeping routines, this can certainly apply uh, when you're thinking about physical activity. So it really is important to establish a routine uh, to incorporate it daily. Um, this will ensure that it becomes a regular part of the day, just like eating breakfast or getting ready uh, to go to bed. Um, second, Plan to participate in physical activity together. So if it's safe to do so as a family, you might consider training neighbors or work up with your friends. Especially right now, when you're organizing can certainly be a very powerful motivator. Um, so that's something else you can consider. And then third, um, you can Think about keeping a daily record or log of what you're doing. Uh, sometimes for children, just being able to measure their progress from day to day or over time can also be another way, one, to make sure that you're doing it, um, but then also just have to celebrate progress. Uh, and then last, probably the most important, um, is that just be creative and have fun. Um, so I think hopefully when we go through some of the demonstrations, you're kind of inspired with some specific ideas. Um, and then I also just wanted to mention right now that the Pediatric Rehabilitation Department here at uh, HSS is currently providing virtual uh, visits uh, through telehealth. So that's physical and occupational therapy. Um, so we're continuing to, to be able to uh, offer that opportunity um, for patients that may need more formal uh, therapy services. And we are actually now also resuming to some on-site visits for our patients. And the institution has put in uh, numerous um, measures to ensure the safety for everyone. Wonderful, thank you, Jennifer. I'm so glad to hear that on-site visits are starting to come back. Uh, yeah, we're going in the right direction. Absolutely. Um, Laura, do you have any uh, dietary tips for staying healthy that you could share with us? Sure, I think Peyton and Jennifer spoke about it, but again, the same rules apply. We wanna make sure that we're trying to establish a routine and that goes for eating as well. So usually we encourage around three meals and one to two snacks. The one thing to keep in mind is obviously different um, levels of activity. So you don't want your child to be overeating, but we certainly don't want them to be under eating as well. So it will help to make sure that they have a routine so that they won't be going to sleep hungry either. And so we wanna make sure that we're including a diverse foods from all the different food groups, protein, lean meats, fish, um, beans, nuts are also great. And of course, our fresh fruits and veggies. And again, you can also have the kids get involved in the kitchen by just simply washing your fruits and veggies. And that's a great snack to have for them to always have available. Low fat, low fat dairy is also great or some cheese or yogurt. And that's great for bone health as well. So that's important to keep making sure that you're including as well. Great, thanks so much, Laura. So now we'll move on into a few demonstrations uh, for some activities and some exercises that you can do with your child at home. So one of the best ways to calm down is by taking a deep breath. Children and adults can turn to deep breathing in moments of upset or it can be incorporated into a daily routine. It sounds incredibly simple, but taking deep breath sends a signal to the body that things are okay. The best way to help younger children control their breaths is through five finger breathing. To do this, you should try have your child copy you as you hold out an open palm and begin to trace your fingers. The instructions are to breathe in through your nose as you go up each finger and then breathe out from your mouth as you trace each finger down. I like to describe inhaling as smelling a flower and exhaling as blowing out birthday candles. For some children, going once across the hand will be enough but for others, they will benefit from going back through the fingers a second time. With older children and with teens, you can practice deep breaths through belly breathing. The instructions for this are to place one hand on your stomach, and as you take deep breaths, you imagine your stomach filling up with air. You breathe in through your nose and let your stomach fully expand on the inhale and breathe out through your mouth to exhale, letting your stomach completely deflate. If your child is comfortable, they should try this with their eyes closed. And it's good to set a goal of five or 10 breaths to start. And if you find them taking quick breaths in the beginning, you can ask them to slow their breaths down for the second half. 
That's great. Thank you, Peyton. I'm going to try that too. <laughs> Jennifer, do you have some? Uh, it sounds it sounds wonderful. Do you have some recommendations for us um, for physical activities? Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to just go through a few. Um, the first will be just something simple to to kind of remind everybody to to take an opportunity to get up out of their chair. Uh, so the first one will be just an idea to kind of work on your uh, building the strength in your leg muscles. I'll then show one just to kind of encourage uh, also getting out of the postural positions that many of us are spending time in now that we're looking at a a computer screen and then one simple one for balance and these are all designed to kind of be incorporated throughout the day um, so that you can just build them into your routine so I'll go ahead and show those now so the first one if you're sitting in your chair um, what you can do is have your child hold something either a ball something large enough so that they have to hold the object in both hands um, so this would be, you know, if they're sitting in a chair or it could be a little bench at home and basically just have her up and sitting back down. So one is get them up out of the chair and moving and two, by having to use the big muscles in their legs to stand and sit without perhaps using their hands, uh, they'll be able to rely on the muscles in their legs a little bit more. And so one fun thing that you can think about if there's a sibling and there's a ball involved, you can, if it's safe to do so inside the home, you can have them catch and toss. Um, or something else that could be motivating is to see how many times you can stand and sit in a 30 second period and then try to beat your record the next day. So anytime they're doing this activity, you wanna just be careful to kind of shift your body forward and be careful not to let your knees go in front of your toes, okay? So it's really just a nice simple way to stand up and sit down and use your leg muscles a little bit more. The second thing that I'd mentioned for working on posture, again, because many of us are sort of stooped forward um, at our computers and desks is to stand against a wall. And this one we kind of call basically like a wall angel. So the idea is to start with your hands close in line with your ears and try to get your arms uh, basically resting against the wall. If this position is too hard, you can certainly bring them in front of you a little bit, but the idea is to keep your, your arms very close to the wall and extend them up, keeping your shoulders down, and trying to think about squeezing your shoulder blades together. And you can certainly even just see as I'm doing this, uh, one, that it's a little bit challenging, but two, it gets me into a very different position than I might have been when I was sitting at my computer before. And then the last one, again, very simple, that you can sometimes fun and a challenge to kind of build in throughout the day. Um, when your child's brushing their teeth, either in the morning or at night, to work on their balance, perhaps, you can have them see if they can stand on one leg while they're brushing their teeth. And if this happens to be too hard, you can either put a ball underneath the foot that's elevated or have them rested on something stable, but you could choose one leg in the morning and then choose the other leg at night. And again, this is just something hopefully either that's fun, um, easy to do, and a reminder because hopefully they're brushing their teeth as well. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. This actually concludes our webinar on staying happy and healthy at home. Um, I hope that some of these tools were helpful for you guys. Please remember, until we're all back together again, um, pediatric rheumatology and physical therapy are seeing patients through virtual visits. Um, and like Jennifer said, we're starting to reopen um, in-person visits as well. Uh, if you have any questions about your child's health or treatment, please call your doctor anytime to discuss. And uh, be well. Thank you so much for listening. We hope to see See you soon. Bye. Bye.